So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ogadegbi, uh, who, for those of you who are in our community and receive our newsletters, you may have been reading about him recently for a very nice, large uh, $12 million grant from the National Institute of Health. Congratulations. Dr. Ogadegbi is a professor of population and health medicine, director of Division of Health and Behavior, and director of the NYU Center for Healthful Behavior Change in the Department of Population Health at New York University School of Medicine. After his internal medicine residency at Montefiore Medical Center, he completed his fellowship training in health services research and clinical epidemiology at Weill Medical College of Cornell University, and then received his MPH from Columbia University. Dr. Ogadegbi is one of the leading experts on healthcare disparities research, with a focus on implementing strategies to reduce disparities in cardiovascular diseases in minority populations. He has significant experience in the conduct of both observational studies and clinical trials of community-based interventions targeted cardiovascular risk reduction in African Americans, and especially focused on developing learning collaborative for primary care providers who deliver care in underserved, low-income neighborhoods. Dr. Ogadegbi practices at Bellevue Hospital Ambulatory Care Practice, where he co-directs the Hypertension Specialty Clinic. He's a member of numerous scientific committees and expert panels of the National Institutes of Health, including the 8th Joint National Committee on the Prevention, Diagnosis, and Treatment of Hypertension, which develops guidelines for the evaluation and treatment of hypertension. He was recently appointed to the Institute of Medicine's Committee, the Institute of Medicine's Committee on Living Well with Chronic Disease, Public Health Action to Reduce Disability and Improve Quality of Life. And we are so proud to have Dr. Ogadebi here with us today. Thank you and good afternoon. Of course, I'm blushing, but you don't see it, um, <laughs> all that introduction. Um, I have probably seven minutes um, to go over seven slides. And what I thought I'd talk about is, you've heard a lot of this already. Um, really, if you look at hypertension, which has been um, indicated by Dr. Silla as one of the major cardiovascular risk factors for stroke, and you look at the disparities between blacks and whites, it turns out that if we can achieve parity in hypertension control, we can actually save um, about 2,190 deaths from stroke. So give you context as to how important it is to address the issue of hypertension when it comes to looking at the, the racial gap um, in mortality between blacks and whites. Here's a study that came out um, uh, from folks in Alabama called the, called the REGARD study. This is one of the um, long-term epidemiologic studies where they're looking at people, about 20,000 or so folks, and looking at the risk factors for stroke. It turns out if you look at blacks and whites, about 70% of blacks who have stroke are hypertensive, and about 50% of whites are hypertensive. But more importantly though, in this study, when they looked at the incident number of strokes, in other words, the new strokes that are occurring, for the same level of blood pressure, blacks are about three times more likely to have stroke compared to whites. So there's something going on there. Just again, highlight the disparity that you have in terms of stroke care between blacks and whites. So what do we know about the racial disparities in stroke care between blacks and whites? It turns out that stroke disparities are a major public health problem in the US. And this is often due to the high prevalence and incidence of high blood pressure and the excess mortality that's attendant to that. More importantly though, there is little data, little, I mean little data, on developing multi-level interventions that's targeting the primary and the secondary stroke prevention in minority populations. And I would actually say there's little outcomes data, period, um, other than what we do acutely for management of stroke. There's some data going on now looking at some preventive um, um, interventions across the country. So the Center for Stroke Disparity Solutions is going to take on all of these challenges and try to address that problem. And basically, this is a study funded. It's a center funded, not really a study. It's a center that has several cores and three large studies, which I'll talk about in a few seconds. Um, it's a consortium between NYU School of Medicine, Columbia University, um, the visiting nurses um, 
home care program and HHC um, with, the, with the idea that we're going to try and reduce the disparities in stroke across New York City and hopefully other parts of the country can use our model. So the center has three major objectives or goals. The first one is to advance stroke disparities research by evaluating innovative, culturally tailored approaches to preventing new and recurrent stroke. The second goal is to expand the capacity for conducting implementation research that's targeted at reducing the stroke disparities through the consortium I just talked about. And of course, the last goal is to train and mentor the next generation of researchers who are going to be looking at ways to reduce the disparities between blacks and whites in terms of stroke. And so what are we doing in the center? We're doing three major things. If you think about stroke, you've heard a lot about acute stroke from Dr. Silla. You've heard a lot about the rehabilitation of stroke from Dr. Rajbon. Think about it this way. We have a community. There's very low stroke literacy rate. People don't activate 911 on time. Patient is diagnosed with stroke. They end up in the hospital, right? And then they get a fabulous care in the hospital. They have sometimes even acute rehab. And then they discharge home to see their primary care doc. It turns out, if you look at where we're having the problems between blacks and whites in terms of their care, most of the action is not in the hospital. Actually, people receive equal amount of care when it comes to stroke across the country. There's no disparities at all in terms of rehabilitation, acute stroke care. The disparities, however, occur before people get the stroke. Very few Latinos and blacks will activate 911. Few people, period, regardless of your race or ethnicity, but even more so if you're a minority. The other problem is once people are discharged from the hospital, this is where folks start to fall off the wagon. You heard Dr. Rajbon talk about a primary care doc. The primary care doc is so important in following up with those cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension, smoking, diabetes, even the atrial fibrillation or the heart disease, all of those things will happen in the primary care clinic. It turns out, when you look at the care between blacks, whites, and Latinos, that a lot of minorities, here's where they fall off the wagon. So what we are doing in the Center for Stroke Disparities Solution is, we're proposing three major studies. Um, we're going to evaluate the effectiveness of three programs that can allow us to plug in those holes. If we can solve that problem, if we can show they're cost effective, then hopefully, hopefully, all of those programs can be incorporated into existing healthcare systems. The first program is called Project 3, where what we're doing there is to actually, we're going to do something called the Tailored Approaches to Stroke Health Education, and that's led by Jide Williams. The idea behind that study is that we're going to create narrative storytelling, Broadway shows and Broadway plays, put them on DVDs, go around the city in churches, and we're going to split those, those churches into two groups. One group is going to get the intervention. The other group will get your regular stroke association patient education materials. And then we see what happens to stroke literacy rates in those areas in the city um, between 12 months to two years. And the hope is that if we can show that we can improve stroke lit literacy rate, then hopefully then that can translate to behavioral intention to activating 911. The second study, um, is the one that is led by the visiting nurse of New York. The idea being, when patients are discharged from the hospital, in the first three to six months, they actually don't get linked up to primary care. So the home health care nurses, what they do is they go to the homes and they provide care. The kind of care they cannot provide, though, is making sure those patients get their diagnosis, their medications for their blood pressure, making sure they're linked to primary care. So we're going to be evaluating two programs. The first program is regular home care. The second program, though, we're going to be attaching to those patients a nurse practitioner because it turns out the healthcare system actually pays for an MP to provide care in the first three months. And then we'll see whether if you provide the acute care after three months of discharge with stroke, can the nurse practitioner be trained to deliver diabetes care, hypertension care, and also link that patient to the appointment with their primary care doctor. And we'll see what happens in terms of the recurrent stroke rates and, and, and functional st um, status for those patients in 24 months. And then the third project is one that I'm leading, where we're looking within the HHC system and looking at patients who already have stroke. They've been sent home. They have their primary care doc. The primary care doc is not as aggressive in managing that high blood pressure. So what we're doing is we're testing two major interventions. One, we give everybody home blood pressure monitors. The beauty of those monitors is that 
It takes the blood pressure readings, and then wirelessly, we can transmit that data to the medical record. And then the same data goes to a nurse case manager, who then calls the patient up and counsels the patient around the same healthcare behaviors that Dr. Silla mentioned, diet, smoking, taking their medications, and making their appointments. And the same nurse case manager actually calls the primary care doc as well and lets them know that your patient has XYZ blood pressure readings. And then in two years, we see how that can lead to recurrent stroke reduction or reduced hospitalization. All of these programs are going to be evaluated for their cost effectiveness, and we hope at the end of five years, if you tune in, we'll have very good results to report that, that can help us to move um, this area forward. I thank you for your attention.